My name is Sandeep. I'm based in Singapore. I'm going to share some learnings I've had with expanding businesses across uh, the complex APAC region. The format I've chosen for today is pretty straightforward. I have some slides. I'll spend 20 to 25 minutes and we'll open for Q&A, like Klaus mentioned at the top. I'll be super honest, 20 to 25 minutes is extremely short period of time to cover everything that you need to do when you need to expand into APAC or for that matter, any international territories. But what I'll make sure to do is to hit some key points and I may miss some of the final nuances as you guys can imagine. So please feel free to hit me up after the call in, in case you guys have like follow-up questions if we don't get to it today. A quick career snapshot. Um, I have spent the last two decades helping businesses land and expand in APAC. Um, I've had the privilege of being in the driver's seat where I launched these companies in APAC. Pretty much all these companies uh, I've joined in and in very, very early stages. In fact, in the last three companies, I was the first marketing hire for each of these three companies. And I had to build the entire marketing function, the growth function, the expansion function, localization, everything from scratch. So I have quite a big experience with that. Uh, started my career with Yahoo in the mid 2000s, got a little, learned my ropes when it came to marketing, joined LinkedIn post that uh, as a director of marketing for APAC. I was the first marketing hire outside the US and I was responsible for growing LinkedIn in APAC. We grew from $5 million of revenue to over $300 million of revenue over the course that I was there at LinkedIn. So uh, just uh, right after that, I co-founded uh, food tech company in Singapore, which was focused on the enterprise uh, space. We worked with over 130 companies, built it to a 6 million annual revenue product. But then unfortunately, COVID came around and we had to shut shop because of that. Moved to Disney uh, to help them launch their ATT, OTT service uh, called Fox Plus across APAC. Again, the first marketing hire helped the business grow from zero to 1 million paid subscribers, close to $60 million in uh, recurring revenue annually. And then the last role that I had was with Twitch, which some of you folks may know is an Amazon company, one of the largest live streaming services in the world. Again, started the marketing discipline in Twitch for APAC and helped grow the business by over 50%. Now, having done this for a long period of time, as you can imagine, across all sorts of categories, be it recruitment with an enterprise tech with LinkedIn, be it food tech with my own startup, entertainment with Disney, gaming with Twitch, I then decided to take all of that and start my own firm called Quantum Leap Ventures. And what I do is basically help startups and companies that are looking to accelerate growth in APAC. I work with them in multiple uh, different ways to basically make sure that they are able to accelerate the growth and they don't have to go through the whole learning process all over again. So that's what I do currently. Uh, so for the expansion framework today, like I'm gonna keep it super simple, like I mentioned, and the way I visualize it is it's like a house. So you have the foundation, you have the pillars, which kind of support, and at the top, um, it's going to be the roof. What I'm going to do to make this easy and uh, easy to digest for everyone is give examples at every companies that I've worked. And most of these are firsthand examples. So you can get a good flavor of why some of these things are super important. And again, like I said, if you have questions at the end, I'm happy to double click on some of those. So I'm going to start with the foundation. Um, in my mind, the core foundation when you're looking to expand in APAC is agility. Now, it's obvious to all of us, especially a lot of you folks who are working in startups and tech startups or tech companies, but uh, I can't underscore this point enough because I've seen a lot of companies fail in APAC by not, by not making this a core form of their existence. And to best share this, I'm going to take an example from a company that I had worked in a while ago. And to make this interesting, it's an example where we failed miserably instead of uh, instead of being successful. So that's what um, I really like to share this example. So um, I'm not going to name the company for obvious reasons, but uh, let's say the company that I worked in was XYZ Corp. And we're going to go from the left to the right of the screen. It's going to be a timeline over a 12-month period, and you'll get the sense of like where uh, we're going with this. 
So I used to work for a company called XYZ Corp. Um, and we were clearly category leaders in that business. Um, we had about 87% market share, well-funded, doing very well on revenues, uh, decently profitable. And then there was a new kid on the block who started uh, the product in that category, just one person market share. And uh, the thing that they did was they launched a different feature which did not exist in the category. And let's call it feature X. And within, I'm going to say a month or two of launching, they quickly went from 1% market share to about 7% market share. And in that period of time, we lost about 4% uh, market share uh, in the category. Now, at this point of time, my company could have done one of two things. They could have taken a punt and gone across and built that feature X because uh, we had all the engineering might and um, we could have easily built it quickly. Or, which is the second option, which is what we chose, is we decided to do market research across all the 14 markets that we were losing sharing. Now, at this point of time, all the market leads, including myself, uh, for the market that I was running, uh, strongly put our hands up and said, like, I don't think we need to spend time and money on market research. Time is of the essence. Let's just go ahead and build product X. But we were a global company. We decided that if you're doing it, let's do it right. Let's get it perfect. And so we did choose option two, which is doing market research in 14 different countries. What that resulted in is we spent about five months to get the proposals, design the research, execute the research in these markets. And during that period of time, our competitor, which is New Kid on the Block, built or started working on feature Y. And as you can see, they kept on increasing their uh, market share through this course of time. And no surprises, when the results of the research came through, feature X was the number one uh, need from all the consumers across each of those 14 markets. By which time, um, as you see, we'd lost almost 12% market share and uh, our competitor had gone up to 16%. Now, even after this, we could have still salvaged the situation. We could have gone and built this faster, but instead of prioritizing this, it was part of the roadmap, product roadmap that was gonna be built. And instead of getting this done in a couple of months, it took us close to six months to get there. And so over the 12 month period, as you can see, we went from 87% market share, dropped all the way down to 62% market share just because of one small thing, which was being agile. And our competitor, as you can see, went up from 1% to 30% during the same period of time. And if you fast forward over the next 12 months, uh, the new kid on the block became the market leader with 55% market share. So cannot emphasize this point enough, and this is true for any business that you guys are in, if you're entering into APAC, these markets move quickly. You've got a lot of local players in these markets who tend to be very nimble. So at the foundation of it all, uh, let's make sure that agility is a core, not just within the team working centrally, but even the teams in region to make sure that they are moving fast and learning what's happening and acting on them as well. Uh, moving from this is... After the foundation, we'll talk about each of the three pillars that um, I have outlined. So the first pillar is local market insights. Now, most companies talk a lot about customer insights in business, which is absolutely crucial. And it's something that I will come, uh, I'll talk about in the upcoming slides. But when we think about market expansion in international geos, understanding market insights is a very, very important factor which can influence or shape the outlook of the business. Uh, these insights tend to be specific to certain business and may change from business to business, but those nuances make a huge difference in the way uh, those businesses work. So in addition to customers, also make sure that there is some bit of market insights built in as you start thinking about expanding your business. Now, again, to explain, I'm going to take a situation. Uh, so LinkedIn was launching uh, its enterprise SaaS business in Asia back in 2010. Uh, the enterprise SaaS business, some of you guys may know this, but basically this allows recruiters and companies to buy licenses, which helps them to source candidates on LinkedIn, right? 
Now, it was a very crowded market at the time that we were going in because there were job boards which existed before LinkedIn and they had like a seven to 10 year head start over LinkedIn in the region. To put things into perspective, uh, LinkedIn at this point of time was like a sub $5 million business mm -hmm. in APAC on the enterprise side. And the rest of the comp competition put together was easily about 300, somewhere between 300 to 400 million at that point of time. Now, like I said, it was important for us to look not at just the consumer insights, but also the market insights. And we found a couple of very, very interesting things. So what we did was we looked at the market insights, we looked at the customer challenges, and we looked at what LinkedIn modes were. We combined the three of them to identify like what's that sweet spot that we should be focusing on in terms of both promoting as well as in terms of improvements, right? So when we combined the three, there were three key insights that came up. One was uh, most job boards across the region were focused on entry-level jobs. However, the largest revenue opportunity was actually in mid to senior hiring, and there was none of these job boards that was focused on that spot. Uh, and that's something that we learned from the market. The second thing, which was also interesting, is um, in these markets, most of the companies that existed did a phenomenal job through offering local payment methods or offering better payment terms than what most American companies or global companies offered in these markets. So let me give you an example. So most, uh, and this is back then, so most American companies in India back then would have offered a 30-day payment term, whereas all the local companies were offering up to 90-day payment terms. So as a customer, I would rather prefer a 90-day payment term over a 30-day. Now it's a very small change or it sounds very menial, but this requires a lot of change in the back end, especially on the finance side, the collection side. So all of these things had to happen in order for us to be successful. The other thing which was quite interesting was a customer challenge, which is the cost of hire and the time to hire, especially for mid to senior professionals, um, they used to tend to be a lot. And since the job boards were only working with entry level, the companies used to rely on recruitment agencies. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the recruitment industry, but if you were to hire somebody through a recruitment agency, you're paying close to 30 to 40% of their annual salary in fees. Now, what we knew as LinkedIn is if you use LinkedIn, you'd probably work it out to less than 3 to 5% of your fee. So using all of these three things, we kind of built out this grid, which looked at LinkedIn, looked at the recruitment agencies, looked at the job boards. We looked at all the modes that we had, which was better time to hire, better cost of hire, better quality of candidates. And we looked at the improvement areas, which are quite straightforward. One was being ex able to accept local payments and the other was local compliance um, things like um, where litigation would have happened and things like that which country should it happen and all of those things which make a big difference for companies as well and we identified that what we need to do over the next couple of years is double down on the fact that LinkedIn is a place where it's time to hire is low cost to hire is low and you get the right quality of candidates and on the back end we focus on improving things like local payment, local payment methods and compliance. And just by zoning down on those two things, within the next three years, LinkedIn grew to become a multi-hundred million dollar business just by doing those two things, right? So now in this case, if you had to roll back a little and we did not know the market realities around which uh, cohorts of people are in more demand or the fact that about local payment methods, we probably would have not been as successful. So it was absolutely, absolutely important for us to understand these little nuances and go from there. Now, like I said, after having spent some time on the local market, now we come to the more obvious one, which is local uh, customer insights. And this should not be a surprise. And I would say probably table stakes for international expansion. But it's also very important to note that customers behave very differently market to market in APAC. And it's absolutely key to make sure that your product and marketing needs to feel local to them. So uh, to illustrate this better, let me give an, a very interesting example of something that happened while I was at Twitch. So for most of you folks who probably know this, but 
Twitch is a live streaming service where creators stream games, music, and various other pieces of content. Now, these streams are free to view, but the creators earn money when their viewers opt to pay for subscriptions or make donations. And that's how the whole platform works. Now, what we observed was that revenue for streamers in the US and Europe far outperformed streamers from developed Asian markets like Taiwan, Singapore, Japan, and Korea. Now, if you were to compare GDPs for these markets, they weren't very different. So these were not markets who have lower GDPs where the streamers would make less. These are probably comparable markets, but we still didn't, or the creators rather still did not earn that much money as we thought that they should. So we uh, went out on something that I call gather, verify, and build, and I'll talk through each of these things. So our first hypothesis was that streamers did not earn enough because we probably had a lot of friction within the product. And which is what most companies tend to think. And the first reaction would be to like, let's fix the product because there's probably something wrong out there. Uh, we didn't do that. We opted to go the gather route, which is let's talk to a bunch of these streamers in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore and, and understand what the problem may be. Through the course of the conversations, what we found was that streamers were not comfortable asking people for donations or money. Now, if you folks follow streamers in the US, be it on YouTube or be it on Twitch, you keep hearing people about like, subscribe to my channel, buy this, buy me X points, buy me Y. That does not happen a lot in Asia. And this is not something that we knew uh, right at the outset. And when we tried to dig in more, what we found out was the reason that this did not happen was more for a cultural reason. Now, in these countries, it is frowned upon to ask for money and asking for donation is kind of equated with asking for money as if you're begging for money, right? So creators are absolutely not comfortable doing this and asking people for money. They felt it was completely out of their culture to do so. But now as a business that relies on creators making money from asking uh, donations, we had to find a solution, right? So the next thing we did was to verify this. Now, because what tends to happen a lot of times is you may gather some piece of information. A lot of this could be emotional and may not be true. So the way we verified this information is we did an audio analysis of thousands of streams, um, both for creators in Asia as well as creators in, say, the US and Europe. And we looked at the number of times the word subscribe or donate was used. And what we found is creators in Asia massively under-indexed on the number of times they would ask their viewers to subscribe or donate. So they were absolutely right in saying that um, we didn't do this for cultural reasons. So, so we figured, okay, there is a problem. There is a problem. They're not asking for it, which is why the viewers are not making the donation. So what we did is a very, very simple solution which is the third phase of build. We said, if we can't use audio cues, which is the creators asking for it, how about we do something super simple, like add a visual cue to the stream, where we just add the cue and that cue should hopefully do the work of telling viewers to make those donations. The beauty about this was the creators loved the idea because it meant that they did not need to ask for money and a visual cue on the screen did not mean too much of work for them either. So we added this view like you can see on the left and you can see on the right where it's in on an actual stream. Uh, we incorporated the visual cue for streamers on their streams. We added some gamification elements as well, which added a sense of urgency and interest among viewers to make those donations. And the results were fantastic. They immediately saw a 20% increase in annual revenues just by putting that small little visual cue on the stream. And the best part is they did not have to change a thing. So this is a great example of, we knew there was a cultural challenge, but instead of trying to change how people do things culturally, we said, let's try and fit ourselves into that culture. And this is a great example of a seamless way of um, making a change happen as opposed to trying to change behavior among people, which is, as most of you folks know, is super expensive and takes a lot of time. Brings me... Uh, to the last pillar that I have, which is, uh, and I've underscored this word through localization. Um, one important learning I've had in uh, working in API for the last 20 years is the fluid use and practice of the term localization. Now, 
what I've seen, the difference between successful companies and the ones that are not, is that the successful companies are constantly evolving and tweaking the product to make it locally relevant. And what I mean by this is you're not completely changing the ethos of what your product stands for. It's just making it localized to a point where if I'm a consumer sitting in Korea, I need to feel that this was made for me. And those are the small little tweaks we're talking about and not the wholesale changes. So, um, and it's apparent in the definition of localization. So typically most companies stop localization at the two words that I've underlined out here, which is translation and local imagery. I would say I shut 90% of the companies stop at that, right? The companies that actually become successful are the companies that start integrating the small little cultural elements that make the massive difference. And like I said, if I'm in a market, if I'm sitting in Korea, I need to feel that the product is built for me. And that's where companies start becoming successful. So I'll illustrate this with a, a great example. And again, this is an example of something that we did not do well, as opposed to something that we did well. So... Uh, in LinkedIn, uh, back in the day, we launched local versions of LinkedIn in different markets across Asia. And every time we did that, we would see huge jumps in new users, engagement, as well as in revenue, right? And one of the last markets or one of the markets that we kept for the end was Japan. And when we launched LinkedIn in Japan, we did not see that same kind of step function jump. And we were quite surprised because I think part of us or most of us were overconfident at that time, thinking that if you've, if you've done this in six different markets, Japan should not be that different. But we learned it the hard way. But the good news is, uh, which is why I mentioned earlier, companies that are always open to making those changes are those companies that tend to be successful. So I'll talk about the first one that happened. Um, now, um, most countries, so for example, and I, I'll give you this example, and I don't know if you guys pick the small little nuance out here. This is how a LinkedIn profile head looks like. In Japan, when you create your profile, you do not use your first name first. You always use your first name second, right? Not many people know about this, but this is really bad user experience because imagine as a Japanese user, when I go onto LinkedIn, I create my profile, I put in my first name, put in my second name, and then I see my profile at the end it shows my first name first. And that's exactly how they don't do it in Japan, right? So it creates a lot of bad user experience. I'm sure it pisses off a lot of users as well, right? So that's something that we missed the trick on. The second one is even more interesting. Now, typically in most markets, when you write your resume, you write it in a reverse chronological order. So you start with your current job first and you go all the way down to your first job. In Japan, it's the other way around. You start with your first job in your profile and your last job is mentioned right at the bottom. Now, we did not know this at the time. And uh, it it definitely, definitely pissed off a bunch of people because this is these are the two main basic things that we should have made those changes. But unfortunately we didn't. Um, and that's that's these are classic two examples, right? I mean, these are the bare basics that we should have done when entering the market, but we did not do it. And this is a hard way that all of us learned. But the good thing that happened uh, right after is we made a bunch of changes, including these two, and uh, we did see a sharp increase uh, in consumers and other revenue metrics. However, I do feel that because we did not make these mistakes, we definitely missed some more growth that could have happened if we had done some of these changes. Now, coming to the last couple of slides, uh, we talked about the foundation, we talked about the three pillars, now we're going to end it up with the roof. The roof is test and, uh, test and scale, I'm sorry. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because this is something you guys know enough about. But in my mind, this is something that should be part of the DNA across everybody in the organization, be it marketing, sales, product, everything. And you kind of... What tends to happen in each of these markets, because they're so different from each other, you kind of test a bunch of things, throw a bunch of darts on the wall. If one sticks, you kind of need to then figure out how do you scale them super, super quickly. So I'll give a quick situation because I know we're running a little bit on time as well. Uh, when I was at Disney, we launched a streaming service for called Fox Plus across multiple markets. What we found in a couple of price sensitive markets is 
we had to bring down our customer acquisition costs in order to drive towards profitability because the math wasn't working out, of course. Now, in all our customer interactions in these price sensitive markets, what we found was every consumer would ask this one question, what can I get more for my subscri subscription, right? So we thought of doing something super easy. And this is a very simplified test that I'm showing on screen. Typically, when we were doing ads for getting users to sign up for a subscription, we would show like one show title in there or one movie title in there. But when we heard from people saying, what more can I get from a subscription? We said, what if we like load it up with more titles and see if it makes any difference at all? And funnily enough, I don't know if this sounds crazy. Uh, when we had two titles on the ad, we probably spent say a hundred whatever bucks, pesos, uh, yen or whatever. With three titles, it starts dropping. With four titles, it went all the way down. And we were quite surprised because the one with four titles looks really tacky. To be really honest, it doesn't look that great uh, from a marketing standpoint. But people loved it. I mean, people just felt that it's worth spending that kind of money if they're going to get all of these goodness, right? So, but this is just a start. I mean, when we figured that this is the thing that's working out with certain genres of shows, say like dramas, we created these for all different genres, like comedy, thriller, action, and saw similar results and fundamentally shifted our customer journey in terms of acquiring new users, be it through ads, be it through PR, be it through the product itself, be it even through our payment flow. So this is a classic example of something where we saw a small slimmer of hope, tested it out, saw it work, quickly scaled it within the next three months, and the good news is, as a result of all of these uh, changes, we were able to bring down our customer acquisition cost by close to 40%, which was our goal of this exercise. So quickly to recap, uh, we spoke about the pillars and the foundation. So you got agility at the bottom, which is the foundation of everything we should be looking at. Local market insights, customer market, customer, local customer insights, I beg your pardon. And true localizations are the three pillars which are absolutely critical and to be very honest, will differ from every single market in APAC. And test and scale, which is at the roof, like I said, is a DNA that needs to be perpetrated across the system and everyone should be looking at it very closely. And from there, it's my last slide. Um, in case you guys have follow-up questions, uh, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn or you can email me as well. And in case you have something specific to your business or your startup, this could be things like expansion of your business into APAC, or if you're trying to solve specific problems with regards to your APAC business or gathering insights, uh, feel free to reach out to me either again via email or LinkedIn. Like I mentioned earlier, I work with businesses to help them accelerate their growth and I would be happy to work with you.